Welcome again to the Princeton Advent Christian Church, and we're here to uh, experience God's presence as well as encourage one another in the joy of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Let's join together in song. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. trusting on in you and your word and your promises during times of affliction and doubt and discouragement. Lord in heaven, we lean upon you in all kinds of cases because you are the one with everlasting life for all who believe. Be praised today. Be pleased to be worshiped in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's be seated or you could be seated, and we're going to continue worshiping some of these choruses that are maybe even more familiar to you. Come, now is the time to Sing to the Lord. 
And I'll never know how much it cost To see my sin upon that cross And I'll never know how much it cost To see my sin upon that cross So here I am to worship Here I am to watching out for us, and he inhabits the praises of his people. So as we praise him, and we're always in tune with him when we praise him. The gospel reading comes from the book of Matthew, and I invite you that you may want to stand with me and uh, continue this tradition of reading the gospel as we stand together starting in Matthew chapter 26 and reading 6 to 16. Let's read together. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why? This waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. You can be seated. May the Lord help as we understand his word. In our passage this morning, we see a great contrast between a woman, not named in Matthew, but named in the other Gospels. She's Mary. Not Mary, Jesus' mother, and not Mary Magdalene, but Mary, the sister of Martha. We've seen Martha and Mary before in different contexts, but in the same home, most likely, or in the nearby home. And they had a brother named Lazarus, and they're all together there in the evening for the meal. And as was his custom, Jesus <laughs> stayed with them in Bethany during a lot of the feast times. Remember, there were three times a year where they were often gathered together as a Jewish nation to worship the Lord uh, together on Passover and the other times. This was one such occasion. This was the last occasion. And the woman, who's identified by John and by Mark as Mary, uh, was uh, on her uh, way, we might say, to offering the most, un probably the most costly gift that she possessed, an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. And she poured it on his head 
as he was reclining at the table. This sits in extreme contrast with one of Jesus' twelve disciples, a man named Judas. He was chosen by Jesus, but yet Judas had a very opposite type of, of view of how things should go about during this time. Instead of giving to Jesus, Judas was interested in what he could get by betraying Jesus. So there's this extreme contrast, which points out the question, how much is Jesus worth? How much is Jesus worth to you? Or what is his value? And we see this contrast between a woman who gave her best and Judas who tried to give away Jesus, the Savior of the world, in order to get things. Extreme contrast in this case between these two things, these two people there, both at the dinner. Then one of the twelve, one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? And they counted out 30 pieces of silver. A betrayer, betrayal. Jesus was not worth very much to Judas. And in fact, there at the dinner, we find in the passage that Judas was the one that was leading the accusations against this woman, in which Jesus kind of came and defended her in just a little bit. We'll look at that. But Judas was the one that brought up how much this could be sold for. Do you remember how much? A year's wage. A year's wage. Think about what was the last amount of money that you made in a year or I'll put on your taxes or stuff like that. Think about that, yeah. And it's all contained in a little jar. Now the jar apparently had no lid. That's alabaster jar. Had a very thin neck at the top. And this was a one-time gift. This wasn't like there was any, you know, little cap to put back on it. It was broken. It was broken and then poured over Jesus' head. Why? Because the extreme value that this woman had for Jesus was kind of clearly demonstrated for him in this way. An extreme contrast. Judas had led the accusations. Why? Why this waste? Why this waste? And the other disciples had kind of followed him along and they pointed out that the money could have been sold and done what with it? Given to the poor. Is there anything wrong with giving to the poor? No, 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 no. Is there anything wrong with um, this idea about it? Not at all. It just wasn't the right time. And the woman had the timing right. She understood that Jesus' value and her gift to Jesus at that moment was worth more in the whole scheme of everything going on, the whole gospel picture, than giving to a poor person. And Jesus pointed out, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my head to anoint for my burial. What was this all about? It was a prophetic sign, but it was also a priceless gift of worship, an extravagant worship of the Lord Jesus. And, you know, scholars are going to debate this. Did she know what she was doing? Did she know that it was for her burial, uh, Jesus' burial? Did she know that, did she see the signs of the gathering opposition? Did she know the Pharisees were coming against him, that Judas was conspiring 
Did she know all of that? And we don't have the complete answer for all of that. But remember last week how they said four times Jesus had revealed that he was going to be betrayed, he was going to be handed over to the chief priests and teachers of the law and be crucified. Maybe she believed, and the rest of the disciples didn't. Maybe she had insight by the Spirit right into this moment, and she anointed deliberately on purpose for Jesus' burial. The perfume... The perfume, we find out from the other gospel of Mark, the perfume is made of pure nard. What in the world is nard? Well, I'm not an expert in plant life from India, but I do know that spike nard, at that time, the only place we know of it was found was in India. How far is India away from Jerusalem? I don't think you're gonna wanna walk there. It was a long way, and the caravans took risks, and robbery was a very common thing. So this was very costly, a year's wage, all in a bottle. How costly was it for, and how special was it for Mary? It's kind of revealed in the details that here is this costly perfume from India, and remember, just a week or two, maybe a month beforehand, her own brother, Lazarus, had died. And she had not broken the jar over Lazarus or to anoint a Lazarus body. Martha pointed out, he stinks. There's an odor. She gave, she withheld it from her own brother to give the costly, most possibly the most precious gift she had to Jesus before his burial as a sign, a prophetic way. It's a beautiful thing, Jesus said. And he defended her about all of this against the disciples that were saying, it should have been given to the poor. But we find out that Judas was just really a thief in all of this, and he wanted the money himself. John tells us, if you look up that in John 12, he wanted to take the money himself and go spend it. Did that cause him then to go and betray Jesus? Some scholars think so. Maybe it was just that. Maybe the value of Jesus was so low that it's like, I've got to cut my losses and get what I can right now. Because there goes 300 denarii that could have been sold and given to me. <laughs> he was the keeper of the money. Did Jesus know that this was going to happen, that he was going to be a thief? And of course he did. And he still made him the keeper of the money. Jesus was always reaching out to Judas, calling him, come on, have faith in me. He wasn't surprised by any of that. So here we have the contrast, extreme contrast and answering the silent question, how much is Jesus worth? Silent question. And so for the woman, Mary, it's answered. Now, you remember Mary and Martha? Sometimes sisters don't always get along. They had a fight in front of Jesus at one of these dinners. Why? Where was Mary? She, Mary? I mean, not Mary, at his feet. Mary was at the feet of Jesus. Where was Martha? Martha was cooking. Martha was serving. Martha was preparing. Martha was doing this and this and this and this. And there was nothing wrong with that. But Mary chose what was better. Here they are again at the dinner. The same area. The same people are there. Martha's serving again. Nothing wrong with that. And here comes Mary, a second time, doing what is better. Service to God is good. Jesus, in fact, said in, in Matthew 25, whatever you have done unto the least of me, you've done it unto me. Giving to the poor is a good thing. But what's this all about? Jesus said, you've done a, she's done a beautiful thing. Why are you bothering her? The implication of bothering 
and it's kind of hidden in the text is you're trying to humiliate this woman. What she's done doesn't really have any value. Why are you doing this? She's done a beautiful thing to me, and it's a prophetic sign. She poured perfume on my head for my burial. Jesus understood this prophetic significance. Jesus understood what was going on. Jesus defended Mary, and for the second time, Mary chose what was better. She chose what was better to do. Mary's a type of hero. But Jesus is the real hero. Jesus defends her in all of this. There's an extreme contrast in what is going on. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? Jesus defended Mary. It's a prophetic sign. Remember the disciples were denying that this was going to happen. They weren't in tune with what was going on. Jesus brings up this as again a sign for them. But the real question of this passage and the real application is how much is Jesus worth to you? So we come right down to it. How much is he worth to you? We can see how much Jesus was worth to Judas. 30 pieces of silver. We also have seen how much Jesus was worth to Mary. Mary gave her priceless treasure, anointed Jesus as king. It went over his head, the anointing. She did for Jesus what she did not even do for Lazarus, her own brother. Jesus was worth more than her family. How much is Jesus worth to you? Is he worth everything? You know, uh, there's a great poet. What was it? Christina Rossetti, I think. And talks about the gift of the Magi. And then it ends, Give him my heart. A priceless treasure. How much can I give him? Give him my heart. She, Mary, gave Jesus her heart. Her priceless treasure. How much is he worth to you? This really isn't about putting things in the offering. This isn't about money, this passage, and all like that. It's really not about that. It's about the value of Christ in your life. So there are more treasures that you have besides money. What about your time? It's priceless. We all have the same amount of time. Is it dedicated to the Lord? You're here answering that question today. What about your talents? Do you give Jesus your best talent? Or do you withhold from him talents that, or from the kingdom things that you could share? Talent in the sense of abilities and, and sharing and, and, and like that. Do you look for opportunities to share the good news, or do you withhold that? No, I'll keep it for myself. How much is Jesus worth? Mary made a public demonstration of that and gave him her all. What about resources? What about direction? What about time and energy and, and, and focus? Do we give Jesus one hour a week? A few minutes a day? The question really comes, how much is Jesus worth? And so, Mary has answered for us, he's a priceless treasure. Judas has answered how much he was worth to him. You know Judas was an unbeliever. All the way, he never really believed. And this is the value of Jesus for the world, the unbelieving world. Jesus is only a means to an end for most of the unbelieving world. Uh, if, it, if it helps me, then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go along with it. 
But once he's not really helping me anymore and giving me what I want, then I'm going to sell off Jesus. That's the way of Judas in the unbelieving world. How long did the money last for Judas? <laughs> One person said, the fragrance lingered longer than the money. <laughs> the fragrance of Jesus, the aroma of life, lingers on each one that believes. Because Jesus is that everlasting life, that treasure. And we can give extravagant worship, not just on Sunday, but give our whole heart to him every day. And each day can be a day where we're living in the newness of life in Jesus. And your life can then take on that fragrant offering, which the myrrh, the nard, gave off there in that room, and it will not dissipate. The Holy Spirit will magnify that fragrance of Christ. And it's a fragrance of life to those who believe and the fragrance of death, Christ's death, to those that are unbelieving in the world. It's a simple passage when we put these two things side by side. But the answer that you give lasts for all eternity. How much is Jesus worth? Won't you agree that Jesus is your priceless treasure? That he's worth everything that you have and everything that he is is more valuable than anything we can possess in this present age. So you can pour out your best for Jesus in the kingdom of God and Jesus will defend you just like he defended the woman and said, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. That's a sign about me, your life. Your gift of extravagant worship is a beautiful thing. Let's pray. The Father in heaven, sometimes, you know, we, we count the cost and, we, and we, we say, I just don't know if I can really give myself and abandon to you, Lord. It's going to be worth it. I don't know if I can really do that. And we thank you for those that have poured out their effort, poured out their talents, their resources, their life direction. Those that have passed the test of this question, how much is Jesus worth? We thank you for their fragrant offering and gift, like Mary and like the other 11 apostles that passed the test later on and gave of themselves as fragrant witness all around the world. Help us to live in that faith and to hear your blessed word to us. You've done a beautiful thing to me. You've done a beautiful thing. May it all be worth it as we believe in you, our Lord, our Savior, and our coming King. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's praise the Lord, and we'll stand and sing a great hymn of faith, How Great Thou Art. Yeah. Uh -huh.
down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. When sings my soul, my Savior, not to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When sings my soul, my Savior, not to thee, how great thou art, how great joy of living for you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. 